Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay, and we're continuing our discussion with Tom Frank. Thanks for joining us again. It's my pleasure, Paul. One more time, Tom's a historian, a political analyst, and he's the author of What's the Matter with Kansas, Listen, Liberal, and lots of other books. Um, before we get started, I just want to frame something for our viewers. Uh, this, I, I don't think either of us think that somehow Bill, Bill Clinton is a demon or Barack Obama is a demon. For that matter, I wouldn't think George Bush or even Mr. Trump, President Trump, is a demon. We're at a stage of the development of this economic, social economic system, capitalism, where ownership is extremely concentrated and yeah. finance is extremely powerful. And they control most of the politics. And these political personalities, they, you know, they come up at certain times. And if you want to be a successful president, you've only got certain choices. You know, if Obama hadn't been a Wall Street loyal person, he never would have been president. Uh, he, yeah. you know, that's a choice he made. So uh, it's not like this is all about the individuals and I their policies. I don't know about that. I think that the way, I mean, uh, we probably don't want to keep going over and over and over this, but the mood of the country in 2008, uh, I think uh, you could have elected, uh, you know, someone who, who was way to the left, uh, uh, you know, who, who really did get tough with the banks. And by the way, you mentioned oh, something very, very important about financialization of the economy. Uh, we had the perfect chance in 2009 when Barack Obama came in to disrupt that cycle and get back to being an economy that actually produces things rather than an economy that, you know, shuffles financial instruments back and forth. And uh, we didn't do it. I mean, we thought we did. We thought we were voting for that. But our leadership chose not to go in that direction. And, and I think an expression of the f power of finance, they selected a guy who could faint left and when he comes to power, appoint Wall Street as his financial team. Yeah, well, that was the big disappointment for me, uh, is watching Barack Obama deal with the financial crisis. Uh, and basically right off the bat, it was apparent that he, I mean, not apparent to me, of course. I was, I was very hopeful, as the, <laughs> as the phrase went at the time, but uh, that, that he was, was going to take the steps that needed to be taken. And by that, I mean that he was going to do what Franklin Roosevelt did to the banks back in the early 1930s. And had control of Congress and could have done it. And not only that, he had the bailout mechanism. He, uh, you know, he had seats on their boards. He had everything at his disposal, uh, including prosecuting these people for fraud. I mean, these are, they were dealing in something called liar's loans. They were packaging... <laughs> They're packaging them up and selling them to retirees in Germany. I mean, this is like, this is so bad in so many ways. And as we all know, they were designing financial instruments to blow up in people's faces, to people, the people who bought it, you know. They, they were doing all this deliberately. We, we know this is true. It would have been, it would have been hard to prosecute them because they have good lawyers. But, you know, you still have to do it. You're the president. <laughs> And not, and not a single prosecution at, a, a, single senior, at a senior level. That's right. He didn't even fire them. This is the other thing. Barack Obama had every authority over these guys. Uh, uh, if you go back and look at what Roosevelt did in the 30s, uh, his bailout agency constantly was firing bankers from their positions because the government basically owned the banks uh, because it had bailed them out. By virtue of bailing them out, they had uh, power over them. And he could remove, and he did, remove bankers from, uh, uh, from leadership positions all the time from management. Obama never, never even did that. Now, he did fire the CEO of General Motors, which they also bailed out. But no, he didn't, didn't lift a finger with the banks. And, and in terms of the banks and, and, and the Well, way they did the get around to, to regulating them later, the Dodd-Frank measure, which we can, we'll come to. But, but in terms of the banks and who gets bailed out and the, and the, the, the inequality of it is why they, right. lose, why they lose control of Congress. When Barack Obama was running for president, he, he said, and I mean, this is, he actually did say this. This is not, not just hopeful thinking by, by a sappy liberal, you know, from Kansas. But he said that, that we were not just going to bail out Wall Street, we were going to do something for homeowners as well. They never did it. They just never did it. Uh, they, uh, uh, I mean, they, and they, they never even did anything for small banks. Small banks all over America went out of business in those days. There was this huge die-off of small banks. Uh, and they never got crammed down. For, do you remember this? This is one of the early fights. There were a whole series of things, uh, of battles in the early Obama years where he was required to choose sides between Wall Street and Main Street. And he persistently 
chose to side with Wall Street on basically every issue that came up. Uh, or take another issue like, uh, I mean, one of the other things that, that people like me were saying at the time, were saying it still. You want to do something about inequality in this country, make it easier for workers to form unions. It's almost impossible to, to form a labor union in America today. I mean, that's one of the reasons workers don't have any power. And his so, number one promise to the unions. To, to organize labor. The Employee Free Choice Act. Correct. They also known as card check. And, uh, and, and labor, you know, they worked real hard to get him elected, as they always do for Democrats, but a little bit harder in 2008. It was a great year. And uh, uh, they come to him, you know, this is our one, <laughs> our one request, you know, this is our one piece of legislation that we really want to get passed. No, not interested, not interested, let it die. And never, never, never gets put forward in Congress. Right. Now, Obama had supported it as a senator, had voted for it as a senator. But as president, no, he, he didn't lift a finger for it. And there's, you can go down the list, there are so many things like that. And you can say, well, look, the man had only been in the Senate for two years, he didn't really know what the job would entail. Uh, and that's true. But he did have Rahm Emanuel at his side, one of the toughest, meanest political fighters in this country. Rahm Emanuel could have gotten anything through Congress he wanted. You know, the Democrats had a majority. They, uh, you know, the, the economy is flat on its back. They're looking to Barack Obama as a hero figure. He could have had whatever he wanted. Well, uh, stronger unions was not something Wall Street wanted. Oh, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> no. And that it's clear where their fidelity but the, was. But the, the, you know, and you, you go down the list of Obama's achievements, you know, and he had, he had some big ones. Um, uh, the, uh, of course, the, the, the stimulus, uh, Obamacare, uh, Dodd-Frank. But if you ask me, all, and all three of them had wonderful things about them. They were all, you know, good things overall. But they all were um, half measures. You know, they didn't they only went so far and no farther because to go any farther would be to uh, start stepping on the, the toes of his, his allies. So, for example, Obamacare. I mean, uh, there was all of this debate at the time whether it was right for the president to stop focusing on the economy and start moving to health care. I didn't really have a problem with that. Health care is the great sort of, you're from Canada, you know this. This is the great unfinished sort of aspect of the American welfare state. You know, we got, we got Medicare, but no more. You know, and so many Democrats have tried to get some form of national health insurance and they've always failed. Well, here comes Obama and he's going to try. I was very happy with that. Uh, what made me unhappy was the, the, the solution that they settled upon, Obamacare, this massively complicated thing. And the reason it's massively complicated is because it's all about uh, making sure that uh, private for-profit health insurance companies Stay viable and continue to make profits. And, and don't, they get don't touch pharma. It. Yes, that's right. Leave it's pharma about, alone. So you're going to have a national health care system where these guys continue to make like these exorbitant profits all the time. How is that going to work? And you don't even allow you, you single to, payer uh, right, Medicare not even for an option. It, and, and it can't even be the, discussed. On. Right, the public option, which Obama said he was for and then changed his mind and, and, let, it, and let it go. And uh, yeah, this is, uh, you know, this is the great missed opportunity. And again, the Republicans played him. They, like I said, the Republicans are very, very, very good at the game. But how they managed to win that one is like, it still boggles the mind. They delayed and they dragged their feet. Do you remember this? Chuck Grassley? You know, Obama, of course, wanted a Republican vote. Just one, just give me one Republican vote, you know. By the way, this is one of his... Um, the Democrats' persistent failings is that they believe in bipartisanship, even when all the evidence of the census tells you to not, not believe in it anymore, that it's a, it's a dead end and it just opens you up for, uh, you know, uh, the Republicans are going to bust some game theory on you, you know, and they're like, you know, you reach out and they're going to retract. It's very easy if someone's looking for your agreement to keep withholding it. And uh, so if you're, you're the guy that's looking for, uh, for bipartisanship, you're going to get played every single time. And how Barack Obama didn't know this is... Well, maybe uh, it's, it's, the, it's the restraints of where your campaign money comes from. Yeah, but anyhow, but the long story short, so the Republicans did play him. So, so and then uh, while they're playing him, Ted Kennedy died, you know, which is like, wow, uh, that's terrible. You know, and this is, you remember what happened. And, and so then Scott the Brown, Brown got in and they had to just, you know, pass whatever they had. And uh, thus Obamacare, with its million moving parts, you know, it's extremely complicated. But it all happens because in the first two years of Obama's uh, administration, when they control Congress, 
nothing significant happens that makes people's lives better. Exactly. Had Obama, that, and this is what's always forgotten, you know, people think, well, there's always a backlash in, in the off-term elections. Not necessarily. And not necessarily one that completely overturns your control of the House of Representatives and ushers in this enormous Republican majority, which is what happened in 2010. That didn't need to happen at all. Barack Obama could have still been in 2010 this enormously popular figure as he was in 2008. All it would have taken was getting tough with the Wall Street banks and showing the people that he was on their side in this uniquely awful economic situation that we were in. So, so you've done a lot of writing and, and you've gone to places that vote for Trump, both in Kansas and other places in Missouri. And places that voted for Obama and then switched. And switched. And, and let's say it is not just about Trump gets elected after the Obama years, but something, what is it, over a thousand seats that were Democratic flipped oh, in state yes, legislatures yes. across the country. That's correct, yeah. Flipped yeah, it's, to it's, Republicans. It's, it's, the Obama years have been, I mean, uh, uh, aside from the presidency, were a disaster for the Democratic Party. I mean, they're wiped out at the state and local level all over America. You just look at the electoral maps, you know, th these trends were already underway. I wrote about it in What's the Matter with Kansas. This was already happening. But you look at a state like, say, Missouri, Okay, Missouri was once profoundly Democratic. Uh, you know, Harry Truman, Stuart Symington, Eagleton, Gephardt. These are all people from Missouri. And uh, it starts to shift. By the time Obama comes in, it's a battleground state. They had a, basically a tie there between Obama and McCain. Uh, and today, you know, Trump takes it by an enormous, you know, an enormous percentage. There are counties, rural counties in Missouri that are, Trump got 80%. Why? This is happening all over America. Uh, er, everywhere you go outside of the two coasts and Chicago and a handful yeah, of outside of big cities, cities. Yeah. yeah this is happening so you look at a map of Missouri Hillary got st. Louis Kansas City Missouri and the college town in the middle and that's it every other county well this is the great story that you and I have now been talking about for what seven episodes of how the Democrats basically lost their touch with ordinary you know average Americans, specifically white Americans. Now, now, we're, we're talking about how the Democratic liberal elite, the corporate Democrats, are beholden to Wall Street and so on. Yeah, so well, they're too, but that's the obviously the answer. But, I mean, but the these two things are related, you understand, but Paul. The, but the Republicans <laughs> are even more so. Oh, I know, I know. It drives you crazy, this whole thing. So Trump is out there. By the way, to get back to Trump, uh, every conversation leads to Trump these days. Trump actually was, was, was banging Hillary over the head with Goldman Sachs, you know, was actually using that against her. It's like, and now look who's you know, Secretary of the Treasury, you know. It, it, it's, it's, it's unbelievable that they're able to get away with it, but they are. How do they do that? Now, that's a really good question. How does a party like the Republicans come off pretending to be on the side of the ordinary people? Well, they do. They do it again and again and again. This is one of their uh, themes is, is, is populism. Now, it's fake they, populism, but they're very good at it. Now, you've been to these places yes, recently. And, and the, but the answer to our question is the Tea Party movement in 2009, 2010. Uh, they, th this fascinated me when it happened. Uh, and I was a columnist for the Wall Street Journal at the time, so I had, uh, you know, I had to, I was on top of the news cycle, not like anymore, now I don't care, but back then I was, you know, I was very uh, clued in. And I was, uh, you know, it was basically we were in a, uh, a smaller scale version of the Great Depression. And so I was, I was, I let all my friends know, you know, I want to go to some protests. I want to see economic protest in action like you had in the 1930s. We know it's going to happen. I want to see it with my own eyes. And the first time I heard about it, someone called me up and was like, yeah, there's a protest happening tomorrow down in front of the White House. And I go to it. It's the Tea Party movement. This was their first rally. And it was all of these lobbyists. You know, all these guys that work for Grover Norquist, all these guys that work for Newt Gingrich, they're all out there. You know, CPAC was in town, the big conservative get together. And so all these guys came over from CPAC and they held this uh, rally and they were wearing ties. And it was <laughs> some protest, right? It was so obviously a put up. And I wrote about it. I made fun of it in the newspaper the next day. You know, it's like, look at this, look at this, this silly made up protest, the Tea Party movement. I'll be damned, it caught on. And this was, a, I'm sorry, to, I'm, I keep blabbing. It was a genius move in this sense. They made up a fake protest movement for hard times. And I mean, they made it up. You know, they said, well, a protest, uh, hard times, you gotta have a protest movement. You know, let's get out there and make one, let's do it. You know, and they did. And, and they managed to, and they uh, managed to change the subject from 
uh, you know, getting tough with Wall Street to deregulating Wall Street. When I talk to people that vote for Trump and I try to talk to them, you know, there's a pretty clear fact base that what Trump is doing is not good for uh, ordinary working people. But they can't even hear it until I start to do a critique of the Obama years. Because they just think you're so partisan. Because yeah. they're experienced yeah. with the Obama years. And if, I just don't see how any Democratic candidate's going to be able to do any better in these areas of the working class and rural America. If they're just, you know, if it's if you're just, just reiterating, if well, they're, they're, Obama's too sacred to touch. Let's let's okay. So let's 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 talk about that. I want to forget the Tea Party movement. This is a huge problem for Democrats, or it was in it was in 2016. Is that they love they love Barack Obama. They admire Barack. I admire Barack Obama. By the way, I should say I I, I soured on him for to some degree from where I was in 2008, but I saw him at the Democratic Convention in 2016, and that man has a gift. He has a way of speaking that is, uh, he can, he's a spellbinder. I mean, I, I listened to him and I was like, you know, all of my cynicism drained away and I was like, let's run this guy for president. This is who you want out there. This guy's great. You know, he was superb. But the problem is that inequality got worse and worse and worse while he was president. I mean, there's a, this is the consequences of not dealing with Wall Street when you have the golden opportunity and you, and you drop it, you know? This is the consequences. Inequality gets worse. What they call the labor share of the gross domestic product fell to its lowest point since, it's been, we, since we started measuring it, which means World War II or the 30s. The lowest point ever for labor share of gross domestic product. That means what labor is taking, as workers are taking. But share of the what, pie. Yeah. Right, as, as opposed to what uh, owners, shareholders are taking. And it stayed there. And that's Barack Obama that happened. And you go around to these, um, you know, these towns that we've been describing, these Trump voting areas, and you talk to people, you talk to working class people, and they are furious with what is happening to their lives. And maybe it's happening to them personally, or maybe it's not. Maybe they've got a pension, maybe they're retired, maybe they've got a secure job, but they can see it coming for their kids, that there are no good jobs anymore. Everybody knows it, and everybody is so angry about it. And the, so, the, so look at the Democrats. Here's the party that should traditionally be in touch with that anger and speaking. They're the party, they used to be the party of organized labor. They should know about this. And instead, they're out there campaigning and saying, remember what Hillary was saying? America is already great. This is poison. This is toxic to be giving, uh, putting out that message I was in saying a year to you, like 2016. I was saying to you earlier, the night before the election, I, I mean, everyone thought Hillary was going to win, so did I. But the night, they, they did a final rally in Philadelphia, and Barack Obama was on stage next to Hillary and spoke, and it was all about the great achievements yeah. of the administration. Well, this is the dilemma, because they love that man, right? Uh, they love Barack Obama, and they can't acknowledge that the economy got worse under his, uh, under his watch. Not for everybody. There's a, uh, 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 yeah, there's a famous quote from Hillary. Uh, actually, it's not famous because it's in, uh, oh, where is it? I think it's in Donna Brazile's book. It's in one of the campaign books. And uh, Hillary says, but how can I say those things uh, without people thinking I'm criticizing Barack Obama? She just couldn't do it. Even Bernie held that. She couldn't bring that. herself to do it. But so I was at the Democratic convention and someone did give a very fiery speech and it was Elizabeth Warren. Mm. And she did talk about everything I've said, she talked about. Uh, the problem is she's railing against these things, and here's the President of the United States sitting up there <laughs> in the box, you know, in the box seat up there. On the, and it's like, how can, and she never mentioned him, of course, right? She, she can't. She's in the same party, they're, you know. Uh, and so they have this terrible problem. And let me go. That they love Obama, but they're very upset. They can see the pain out there in, in the country, but they can't criticize it. It goes even further. When, when and so Trump is no dummy. Trump can see this. When, when and so Trump... Trump drives out, his, just parks out in the garage. Trump drives at home. And Obama is actively now fighting against the Sanders forces in the party. He is not hands off. When they had the fight over the DNC chair yeah. with Tom Perez, Obama's working the phones to stop yeah. Keith Ellison. Well, uh, uh, Barack Obama himself, I mean, this is, so presidents, you know this, they care very deeply about their legacy. And so it, it's going to be very hard for him to, uh, you know, to, to acknowledge, it would be for any president to acknowledge that there, that, that there could have been something, that there were shortcomings. 
during his presidency. It's very, by the way, I wrote a, one of the stories that I'm, that I'm proud of that I wrote a while ago is where I visited a bunch of presidential libraries. I went to the, the two George Bush libraries and I went to the Bill Clinton library and they're all very evasive. They all try to d get their, their, their principal out of trouble for various things. But the one that really you know, blows your mind is the George Bush Jr. Library because this is a president, everything went wrong. You know, the Iraq War, Hurricane Katrina, the things we were listing before. And of course, financial crisis, you know, economic disaster, right? This guy's just like one disaster after another. And of course, 9-11. Uh, and um, how do you make a presidential library for something like that? <laughs> and it really poses quite a, a challenge to the historian to try to, you know, get him off the hook for all of these things. Uh, I haven't been to the Nixon Library, but I imagine it's the same kind of, the same kind of deal, you know. Uh, but presidents are very zealous about guarding their legacy, so that's I'm sure that's where, uh, you know, that's Barack Obama. Well, partly is not legacy, and partly uh, uh, maybe we don't agree on this. I, I think he he has very much taken up the uh, mantle of representing Wall Street interests, and that continues in mm. terms of who's going to control the Democratic Party. Because I think the last thing on earth. Wall Street wants is a Sander or Sander-esque, yes. you know, maybe Elizabeth but you need Warren. To, you need to, to, if, to fast forward to the end of Obama's time in office, and it wasn't Wall Street anymore that was really calling the shots. He, they grew disillusioned with him after, uh, after, after Dodd-Frank. They didn't like that, and they were, they were very annoyed by it. Uh, and they shifted to Mitt Romney, remember? And so they, they put all their money on the Republican in 2012. He loses. And so they're out in the cold. But uh, who stepped up for Barack Obama? It's Silicon Valley. And by the, by the end of his time in office, he had achieved this, the kind of um, relationship that Bill Clinton had with Wall Street and that Obama had with Wall Street early on in his presidency. He had achieved with Google. And he'd brought all these people in from Google and some from Facebook. And the Democratic Party's relationship with Google and Facebook became very, very, very close by the end of his time in office. And you look at Hillary Clinton, you know, uh, on the campaign trail, there's Eric Schmidt. By the way, if, if you go back and read Listen Liberal, Eric Schmidt is this kind of Where's Waldo figure. He just, he keeps popping up. This is, the, was the, uh, the CEO, CEO of, 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 of Google. Uh, of yeah. Google yeah. Yeah. And it's like at Obama's first press conference on the economy in 2008, right after he's elected, there's this whole uh, bunch of, uh, uh, of business leaders on the stage with him. And he's like, one of them is Eric Schmidt. There he is. And he's like, you know, Hillary Clinton's giving a speech in, in the Netherlands or something. And she does a shout out to someone in the audience. It's Eric Schmidt. It's like he just keeps showing up. It's it's kind of weird. Well, the other great allies of both the Clintons and Barack oh, and Obama. Mark Zuckerberg, of course. I'm sorry. No, Excuse I wasn't me. going to say Mark Zuckerberg. I'm segueing here. Yeah. Uh, was Harvey Weinstein. Ah. Okay. Well, in the next segment of Reality Asserts Itself, we're going to discuss Harvey Weinstein's relationship with the Democratic Party, with Barack Obama, with the Clintons, and what that tells us about America. So please join us for that. Don't forget, we're in our fundraising campaign. Every dollar you donate, we get matched. And it's a very important time of year for us in terms of fundraising. So if you like Reality Asserts Itself and shows like that on The Real News, please donate. There's a donate button somewhere around this video. Thanks for joining us.